Uh, this isn't planned, but I'm recording this lecture on wakefulness and sleep at 1.30 a.m. I've been up all day recording lectures for you. I don't want to say that I'm sleepy because I'm not. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's talk about some wakefulness and sleep. So back in the day, we assumed that our cycles of wakefulness and sleep were wholly dependent on external stimuli, like the sun. It goes up in the sky, and we go, time for us to wake up. It goes down, and we go, okay, sleepy time. But Kurt Richer, in 1922, proposed that the body generates its own cycles of activity and inactivity, a rhythm, if you will. So, fun fact, some animals uh, generate what's called an endogenous circannual rhythm, which is a cycle that is based off of the year. So, for example, birds will migrate, bears will hibernate, uh, my ex-girlfriend will dump me, uh, and then come back. Uh, just kidding. That is not a circannual rhythm because I don't have an ex. I'm very lonely. But all animals, uh, yes, including you, produce endogenous circadian rhythms, which are internal mechanisms that operate on a 24-ish hour cycle. Uh, so that is our sleep cycle, when we eat and when we drink, changes in body temperature, secretion of hormones, urination, and sensitivity to drugs. So as I've mentioned before, scientists like to do mean things to animals just to figure out how science works better. It's real good and it's real ethical. So they took this uh, little squirrel and they kept it in total darkness. And so you would think that if a, uh, if your cycle is completely inborn, you would just fall asleep at the same time time and wake up at the same time. I'm not, get out of here, you cat. Uh, the, <laughs> sorry, uh, he does this every night at 1.30 and it's great. Uh, so the, uh, what would happen is that every time that the squirrel went to sleep, its waking period would start a little bit earlier than it did the uh, previous day, and its sleep period would start a little earlier than it did the previous day. So you're getting a shifted sleep schedule. So part of our sleep schedule is based off of how uh, we are told by external stimuli to wake up and go to sleep. So let's just say you had a job or a place that you went to weekly, like school, right? And you had all these external obligations and they told you to wake up at certain times to be at certain places. Now let's just say randomly that was taken away, right? And you didn't have to go to these things anymore or you couldn't go to these things anymore. What you might experience is a shifted sleep schedule where you don't fall asleep until 5 a.m., you wake up at 2 p.m., the next day you don't wait, uh, fall asleep until 7 a.m., but then you wake up at 1 p.m., and then you fall asleep at 9 p.m., but then you only sleep four hours because the normal external cues that you use to determine when to be awake and when to be asleep aren't there anymore. Our temperature actually changes depending on where we are in the day. A nice little sinusoidal graph. If you want to test this for yourself, make sure you have the right thermometer. Uh, in this case, not just any regular thermometer will do. Make sure you get the right one. And uh, you know, feel free to test that and see if your temperature does change. Also, our positive moods. Some people 
tend to be more positive uh, later in the evening. Uh, if you are uh, cranky in the morning, you're not alone, right? Uh, and uh, some people tend to have a peak right around lunchtime, uh, but tend to be pretty grumpy as they're getting into traffic. So we have a circadian rhythm, which is in tune with our biological clock. Uh, it is the thing that allows us to stay in sync with the outside world. It is based off of external cues. So that is why if you move to a different time zone, after a while, you can adjust. If it were not related to where you were, then you'd always be falling asleep at the same time, regardless of the relative time. So we have a rhythm slightly longer than 24 hours uh, when there's no external cue to uh, react to. So if you were in a place where you could not tell whether it was daytime or nighttime, or there is no clear delineation of when you need to fall asleep or when you need to wake up, you would see that your sleep schedule would shift. So sometimes it's necessary for us to reset our rhythms. So we have these things that are called zeitgebers, which are things called time givers. These are things that exist in the outside world that kind of tell us when we should go to sleep or be awake. So think about food, think about temperature, think about sunlight, right? If it's naturally more uh, light outside, if the sun's shining brightly, your body's not going to think that it's time to sleep. If it's warmer, then your body's going to think that it's the middle of the day. So these things tell our body that we should fall asleep or we should be awake. When we try to wake up to things uh, that are not natural, so for example, an alarm clock, you might experience depression, irritability, or impaired job performance because your body isn't working within its normal circadian rhythm. So one fun thing that can happen is depending on where you are in a country, the sun could set earlier or later. So when we're looking at the difference between West and East Germany, there's a slight difference in when the sun is setting. So if you're falling asleep when it's still light out, you're probably not going to get the same quality of sleep as somebody who's falling asleep once it's actually dark out. You might be familiar with the term jet lag, which is when our circadian rhythm is disrupted because we are crossing time zones. So going from one time zone to the next one is just an hour, usually not a big deal for people. Going multiple time zones can really mess you up, especially when it's noon, when your body thinks that it's 2 a.m. Uh, so that mismatch causes issues because you'll be sleepy during the day and sleepless at night. So it's going to be very hard for your body to reset. So when you travel west, it phase delays our circadian rhythm. When you travel east, it phase advances. I often uh, visit my dad who lives in Florida. And so we have a very hard time because he, first of all, wakes up very early. I tend to wake up very late. But if I'm being woken up at 12 in Florida time, that's 9 a.m. in normal, uh, not normal, but like in my body's uh, Pacific Standard Time. So if he's like, hey, son, let's uh, wake up. It's 9 a.m. Uh, I let you sleep in for a couple of hours. His body thinks that it's 9 a.m. and it's like a normal day. My body thinks that it is 6 a.m. and I am miserable. Always happy to see my dad, but always so sleepy when I visit him. And by the time I finally adjust to Florida time, uh, then I go back home and then I'm going to bed uh, way too early. And it just throws me off for a month. 
It's fine. So jet lag is worse when you're flying east. I will tell you my terrible flying to New York story. I was going there for a film festival, very exciting. I took a red eye uh, and so I left at I think midnight uh, in from Burbank and then I got there at 6 a.m. Uh, New York time and then uh, I was just awake the entire day. Like I, there, I almost slept a little bit on the plane, but because I usually go to bed pretty late, the time that I would have been falling asleep was the time when I should have been awake because it was New York morning time. And by that time we were already doing things and things were happening. So I couldn't just go and sleep for half the day. So yes, flying east, very difficult. Oh, oh, I never want to do that again. But I'm probably going to because I'm on the West. So that's how that works. So some of us might have experienced a night shift. Uh, now, sleep duration depends on when you go to sleep. But just because you're working at night, it doesn't necessarily mean that your circadian rhythm is going to change. Remember, there are external cues that we look for. And if they're not there, right, if when you get home, the uh, sun is rising, then even though you are tired, you're still going to feel like you should be awake. So people adjust best to night work if they sleep in a very dark room during the day and work under very bright lights at night. You have to make sure that you're giving your body the right cues so that your circadian rhythm works properly. Also, some people are just morning people and evening people. Uh, so first of all, one aspect of it is age. Young children tend to be more morning people. Adolescents tend to be more night people. Uh, but as an adult, it depends a lot on your genes. So some of us can wake up at six or seven in the morning. Uh, and some of you are laughing at me and I'm going like, that's late. I wake up at five or 4.30. And I'm like, how? Uh, because your brain just is alert during that time. Your body feels like that is the natural rhythm, right? For me personally, Right now, it's 2.10 a.m. and I'm still wide awake. I haven't yawned once today. And when I woke up, uh, it was uh, around noonish because I slept in uh, and I felt perfect. I felt a little groggy, uh, but I could work for the next two hours and be completely fine because my brain is wide awake. When you ask me to uh, be somewhere at like 10.30 a.m., I'm just like, Whew. Okay, I'm going to have to wake up at 9.30 and I just, it's literally the worst thing for me. But if you're like, hey, can uh, we meet at like midnight? I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, also, maybe just don't randomly ask me to hang out with you at midnight. I just realized how terrible that sounds. We're probably selling drugs, which <sighs> got to pay off those student loans somehow. So not just age, but gender uh, affects our circadian rhythms. So if we think about this, uh, one big thing uh, that affects our circadian rhythms is temperature. And we know, if you did not know this, now you do, uh, that men and women have uh, slightly different uh, resting temperatures and comfortability when it comes to temperature. Uh, so that sensitivity could also affect why uh, uh, there are differences in circadian rhythm. Uh, but if you see men over here and females over here, uh, you were very impressed by my ability to draw a line where there was already one. Uh, I'm not, I, I didn't graduate kindergarten. Now you guys know uh, where you had to, you know, like trace the line. I uh, definitely was very good at that skill. Uh, so 
I uh, got a D in kindergarten and I'm a college professor. Now you know my dark, dark secret, but age and gender can affect our circadian rhythms. Let's talk about some mechanisms of the biological clock. We have the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. We have some genes that are producing proteins as they do. And we have melatonin, which if you haven't heard of that before, you might, uh, you might actually have because it is a very common sleep aid. It doesn't make you sleepy. It just tells your brain that it is time to sleep. So the SCN is located above your optic chiasm uh, and is part of the hypothalamus. It is your main control center for circadian rhythms, sleep, uh, and temperature. So uh, damage to the SCN results in uh, much more difficulty in maintaining your consistent body rhythms. So if you don't have it to kind of keep the rhythm, then your rhythms are no longer going to be synchronized to what's happening in the environment. So here's our little optic chiasm, and right there, right where uh, the hypothalamus is, we have our little SCN. Uh, what a cute little baby. Oh boy. Hi there, SCN. Go to sleep, go to sleep, maintain my circadian rhythm. So if you pull a cell out of the SCN and you just raise it in a adoptive tissue culture, it will continue to produce action potentials in the same rhythmic pattern. Uh, in a similar way to how our heart muscles, uh, even if they're not being triggered, uh, will beat rhythmically, uh, the cells in the S uh, SCN will continue to produce a rhythmic action potential. Uh, so now other cells are communicating with each other to uh, like sharpen and uh, really hone into a specific circadian rhythm but still, the SCN has a rhythm of its own. So if you remember, uh, the SCN is right near the optic chiasm. Uh, so there's a little bitty branch of the optic nerve called the retinohypothalamic <laughs> hypothalamic path, sorry. Uh, and that gives us information from the environment specifically related to light. The more light we're getting, right, the more uh, we're going to go, oh, it's daytime. The less light we're getting, the more we're going to go, ah, it's nighttime. So this is a blind mole rat. Uh, look at this little guy. Um, Oh, I'm angry. You better get off my lawn, you millennials. Um, he's also got like a little goatee. Uh, so the, uh, and maybe he's, you know, got a gun. Um, I don't know how to draw guns. Uh, so the, uh, the, he just has a, a cool table. Uh, so the um, mole rat, uh, just because it is blind doesn't mean that it can't reset its SCN. So it does have the ability to respond to light, but it doesn't have sight. Uh, trippy. So there are two types of genes that are responsible for generating the circadian rhythm. Period genes produce proteins called PER. Timeless genes produce proteins called TIM. These two proteins, PER and TIM, increase the activity of certain types of neurons in your SCN that regulate sleep and waking. So if you have a mutation in the PER gene, uh, that could result in an odd circadian rhythm or decreased alertness if you're deprived of a good night's sleep. So as you can see, based off of the time of day, 
your uh, concentrations of PER and TIM are going to change. So our SCN regulates waking and sleep, and it regulates the pineal gland, which is an endocrine gland located posterior to your thalamus. Uh, so point to your thalamus right now. There you go, right there. And it secretes melatonin, a hormone that increases sleepiness. Now, melatonin secretion usually naturally occurs two or three hours before bedtime, and it feeds back and resets your biological clock by affecting the receptors in your SCN. So if you take it in the afternoon, uh, it can phase advance your internal clock and it can be used as a sleep aid. So you don't want to, you know, if you're trying to fall asleep at 1 a.m. Uh, and it's 1 a.m., if you take melatonin, you don't want to take it right at when you're trying to fall asleep because it's secreted a couple hours uh, or more before you're actually going to fall asleep. So what is sleep and what's the purpose of it and what makes sleep happen? Stay tuned and find out. So sleep is produced by the brain. It is characterized by a decrease in brain activity because you're not doing as much as you're normally doing uh, and a decreased response to stimuli. So if I were to say, hey, you, right? Uh, you'd probably turn and go, oh, what, me? But if I say that to you while you're sleeping, uh, which I do, uh, you know, uh, lock your windows at night. Uh, you weirdos, it's not safe out there. Uh, but I, you know, sneak in and I go, hey, you, because you're asleep, you might not respond to that. But also, lock your windows. So sleep is different from other states that might seem similar to that. Coma, vegetated states, uh, minimally conscious states like when you're in a class and I'm talking about sleep and you tune out for a little bit, and also brain death. So they can seem similar, but there are differences. So there are many things that can interrupt our consciousness. We have a coma, which is an extended period of unconsciousness, low brain activity, and it's fairly steady the person is going to not really respond to any external stimuli. A vegetative state, a little bit different. You're alternating between periods of sleep and moderate ar arousal, but there's no awareness of the, uh, any surroundings. So there might be responses to painful stimuli, uh, but there's no purposeful activity. There's no response to speech. Then we have a minimally conscious state, so it's a little bit higher than a vegetative state. There might be occasional brief periods of purposeful action or limited speech comprehension. If you've ever seen somebody who had alcohol poisoning and uh, was blackout and past the point where they're, you know, they're kind of like they sometimes respond, uh, but most of the time they're kind of in this weird trance that would be a minimally conscious state. And then we have brain death where there's no brain activity and no response to any stimulus. So the electroencephalograph uh, allows you to monitor brain activity over time uh, and you'll get this readout based off of where you put these different uh, electrodes on the brain. And a polysomnograph takes it one step further by doing the EEG, but also measuring eye movement. Eye movement, that was a weird way to, eye movement. I can say that word, I've said it before. I'm very good at saying eye movement, just so you know. So we have brain activity recorded right here. On an EEG, you can see the little electrodes that are touching the head. 
in order to respond to the very light electrical stimulus that is produced by the brain when it is active. So when we're looking at stage one sleep, when we're relaxed, we have alpha waves that are present. Uh, so this is a very early stage. Uh, it's when sleep has just begun and the uh, voltage waves are gonna be regular, jagged, and low voltage. In stage two sleep, you're going to see these 12 to 14 uh, hertz waves during a, uh, a half second burst. And you'll also see what are called K complexes, which are sharp wave uh, associated with temporary inhibition of neuronal firing. Stage three and four are our deeper states of sleep. So the recordings are gonna show slow, large amplitude waves. You're gonna also see that your heart rate and breathing and brain activity are going to slow down. This is where we have very highly synchronized neuronal activity. Then we also have REM sleep, which is very, it has the qualities of deep sleep and light sleep, which is why it's often called paradoxical sleep. So the EEG waves are regular. Uh, they can also, uh, they're also low voltage and fast. The muscles of the body are also more relaxed than in other stages. So here are some readings from different polysomnographs. So we can see that depending on what state of wakefulness or sleepiness we're in, we'll get different brain readings. Uh, so here's a little K complex right here. Uh, yeah, there you go. Look at it. Uh, that's, that's your brain. So if it's not REM sleep, rapid eye movement, it's called NREM sleep, non-rapid eye movement. Uh, it's a very, very original name. Uh, what's that, uh, what's that rapid eye movement one that's, uh, not rapid, uh, eye movement? Oh, you mean non-rapid eye movement? Yeah, the one where rapid eye movement doesn't happen. Yeah, that's non-rapid eye movement. Uh, when you are asleep and not in REM sleep, you go through the stages, uh, one, two, three, and four in sequential order. You stay in four for a while, and then you cycle back three, two, one, uh, that cycle continues to repeat and each one lasts about 90 minutes. Earlier in the night, you're seeing a lot of stage three and sleep, uh, stage four sleep, which is deeper sleep. Later in the night, you're seeing more REM sleep. Uh, REM sleep is when you do a lot of your dreaming. Uh, but also you can dream in other stages. So here we go. Uh, we go from 2 to 3 to 4, to 3 to 2 to REM, to 2 to 3 to 4, to 3 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 2 to REM. Uh, this could be a real cool rap song. Yo, we go 2 to 3 to 2 to REM to 2 to... That, actually, no, it's not a good... That would not be a good rap song. But as you can see, our sleep goes through these different stages. Uh, and you can see right here, spending a good chunk of time in that deep state of sleep. Uh, we're cycling through these different stages all throughout the night. So now we're back to our good old friend, the reticular formation. It is a part of the midbrain and it extends from the medulla to the forebrain and it's responsible for arousal. You guys know me. I always say you can't talk about the reticular formation without mentioning the pontomesencephalon. I'm always talking about the pontomesencephalon, guys. The pontomesencephalon has axons that extend into the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the basal forebrain, and they release acetylcholine glutamate 
uh, and or dopamine, a lot of excitatory effects to various parts of the brain. Uh, and what happens is when the pontoencephalon uh, gets stimulated, it's a uh, waking you up and uh, increasing alertness. So if you think about it, right, if you are releasing dopamine, you're getting ready to move, you're releasing glutamate, you're telling your neurons to fire, it is responsible for waking you up. So if you woke up today and you're feeling a little groggy or you were feeling groggy, you know who to blame now, our old friend, the pontomesencephalon. And you know what I always say after that is that you can't talk about the Ponto mesencephalon without talking about the locus coruleus. Uh, the locus coruleus is a small structure in the pond, and it releases norepinephrine. Uh, remember our old friend norepinephrine, also responsible for alertness, and it's also helping you to wake up. Usually, the locus coruleus is dormant while we're asleep. If it's active while we're asleep, we could have issues. So sleep, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, issues in sleep, insomnia, uh, feeling drowsy during the day, uh, even though you've gotten lots of sleep, uh, narcolepsy, there are lots of very specific structures that uh, work in tandem to ensure that we can fall asleep and get the proper types of sleep, and then we can fully wake up. So our good friend, the hypothalamus, contains neurons that release histamine, and they produce a bunch of excitatory effects throughout the brain. Now, if you've ever had allergies, uh, then you know that histamines, uh, which are usually your best friends, can work against you. So you might need to take an antihistamine in order to help you with some of those allergy symptoms. If you've ever taken Benadryl, then you might know that it makes you sleepy, uh, makes you real drowsy. Uh, definitely don't recommend uh, you getting like five Benadryl right now and, you know, trying them just to see uh, how crazy uh, an experience it will be. I do not recommend it. I'm not being sarcastic in saying that I'm not recommending it so that you actually try it. Don't do it. I'm serious. But because antihistamines are antihistamines, they have the opposite of the excitatory effect. So that is why things like Benadryl make you more sleepy. So orexin is also released by the hypothalamus, and it doesn't wake us up, but it helps us stay awake. And then we also have our old friends GABA and acetylcholine. GABA is inhibitory and it's essential for us to sleep. When you drink alcohol, it tells your brain to release GABA. That's why alcohol can make you feel sleepy. Other axons uh, from the basal forebrain release acetylcholine, which is excitatory and increases your level of arousal. Benadryl, which I just spoke about, is what's called an anticholinergic drug, meaning that it stops cholinergic chemicals from being produced. What is a cholinergic chemical, or do you, can you think of an example of one? That's right, acetylcholine. So because Benadryl is uh, anticholinergic, it prevents acetylcholine from being produced in the brain, meaning that it's going to decrease that excitatory and aroused state of your mind. So here we can see various pathways for acetylcholine, GABA. We have our basal forebrain here in the hypothalamus. Uh, we have some histamines here, right? Uh, the me uh, mechanisms of sleep and waking are very complex, but once you boil it down to its main parts, it starts to make more sense.
GABA is great because it is inhibitory, so it's useful for decreasing our temperature and metabolic rate, and also for decreasing the stimulation of neurons. So just to review, pontomesencephalon, it releases acetylcholine and glutamate and increases cortical arousal. The locus coeruleus, norepinephrine, increases information storage during wakefulness, suppresses REM sleep. The basal forebrain releases acetylcholine. Uh, it excites the thalamus and cortex, helps with learning and attention, and it shifts you from NREM to REM. Uh, then we have the basal forebrain, which releases GABA. It inhibits your thalamus and cortex, slowing things down. Your hypothalamus uh, can release hi uh, histamine or orexin, which increase arousal and maintain wakefulness. And then you have your do dorsal raphe and pons, which release serotonin, which will interrupt your REM sleep. During REM sleep, you have more activity in the pons and your limbic system. The activity uh, that decreases is in your primary visual cortex, your motor cortices, and your uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So a lot of uh, this probably makes sense because you don't need to process a lot of visual information coming from your eyes. You're not moving as much. So a lot of the normal uh, activities that you do while you're awake, don't need to be as active. If you're a big fan of REM like I am, oh, then you know their greatest hit, PGO waves. PGO waves are high amplitude electrical potentials, uh, and uh, so high amplitude uh, is that compared to like this, right? This would be the high amplitude. Uh, and when you interrupt uh, REM sleep and you're not giving a lot of, or you're not getting a lot of REM sleep, then what will happen is you'll see those PGO waves uh, in other uh, types of sleep. So one important thing that occurs during sleep is uh, our good friend the pons sends messages to the spinal cord to inhibit motor neurons. So you don't want to be moving while you're sleeping, right? Uh, if you're having a fight with ninjas in your sleep, you don't want to actually throw punches and kicks. You'll wake up with a hole in your wall or a broken hand, right? So this inhibition of motor movement during sleep is very important. Uh, REM uh, is also regulated by serotonin and acetylcholine. Uh, so if you have a drug that uh, stimulates uh, acetylcholine receptors, it's going to get you uh, much more, it's going to get you into REM much more quickly. But serotonin interrupts REM sleep. Uh, so if you were taking a uh, antidepressant, uh, which is a, uh, for example, a ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, you could have issues getting into REM sleep or staying in REM sleep because your brain is uh, having more serotonin available. So here are some PGO waves in different parts of the brain. Uh, we see those high amplitude little areas. Uh, there you go. So we have insomnia, which you've probably heard of, which is probably the most common sleep disorder uh, as far as people having it and knowing about it. Uh, it can be associated with lots of factors, either controllable ones or uncontrollable ones. So things like noise, stress, pain, your diet and medications that you're on. Uh, so if you're in pain, you're going to have a much harder time staying asleep uh, or falling asleep and staying asleep. Other uh, disorders, uh, medical and otherwise, uh, epilepsy, Parkinson's, depression, uh, can all affect your ability to sleep. Uh, so 
some uh, times when people have uh, a dependence on sleeping pills or alcohol to fall asleep uh, that can, or if they're having uh, shifts in the circadian rhythm. So let's say you're jet lagged because you just uh, traveled halfway across the world that can affect uh, your ability to fall asleep. So here's just an example of a sleep disorder as a result of a shift in your sleep phase. So if you are normally uh, in this area where you fall asleep right where your body is used to falling asleep, but there's a slight shift right here, right? You're still pretty alert when you should be falling asleep. Uh, or if it moves in the opposite direction, then your, uh, your normal sleep period is happening when you feel like you should be awake. So if your body is expecting you to be asleep or be awake, then if you're trying to do the opposite, you're going to have a very hard time. That's why one of the most common uh, suggestions for treating a sleep disorder is making sure that you have a consistent sleep schedule. So uh, even if you don't have work on Saturday and Sunday, wake up at the same time that you would normally wake up so that your body can get adjusted to a specific 24-hour cycle. So sleep apnea is characterized by an inability to breathe while sleeping for a prolonged period of time. Uh, this could be due to a variety of factors. Sometimes it's something uh, genetic or congenital where the structure of uh, your, um, <laughs> uh, your body makes it harder for you to breathe while sleeping. Uh, so you might have to uh, adjust how you sleep. Uh, obesity can also affect this, uh, where you just stop breathing for periods during the night. Uh, sometimes it's an issue in the brain, where uh, there's a part of your brain that tells you to breathe while you're asleep. Uh, so not getting oxygen and not getting proper sleep are both significant issues and people with sleep apnea can be sleepy during the day. They can feel depressed. They can have heart problems. They can have impaired attention. Uh, they can feel real grumpy uh, because when we don't get sleep, we don't, we are, we, it's very hard for us to be our best selves. Uh, so sleep apnea uh, is, can be very dangerous. This is a CPAP machine, and it is used as a treatment for sleep apnea. This is a pretty old uh, picture of a sleep, uh, CPAP machine. They're a lot smaller and more portable now. They used to be relatively loud, uh, and it's one of those things where, yes, it's loud uh, and annoying, but also it saves your life. But now we've made CPAP machines that are much smaller and less invasive. You may have also heard of narcolepsy if you're ever feeling down. Go do a little YouTube search on animals with narcolepsy. You'll see little puppies running through a field and suddenly falling asleep or goats who are jumping around and after one jump they fall asleep. Cute little guys. Uh, but narcolepsy is a sleep disorder characterized by frequent periods of sleepiness. Uh, so you could uh, just randomly feel very tired randomly during the day. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's gradual, sometimes it's a sudden uh, onset. Uh, so I could be talking and then I could feel more tired. Oh, I was like, go on. Oh, sorry. Uh, or I could just be talking and then, oh my God, oh, I, I feel like I need to sleep right now. Uh, now, most depictions of uh, narcolepsy uh, involve cataplexy, which is the loss of uh, muscle tone. Uh, so that's when you see people um, who um, are, you know, having a conversation. If they have a sudden onset, they'll just collapse and fall asleep. Uh, but not all narcolepsy involves cataplexy. We also mentioned sleep paralysis before, uh, which is when you uh, can't move while falling asleep or uh, waking up. Uh, or, uh, and there's, uh, so hypnagogia, 
uh, is that middle state between sleepfulness and wakefulness. Uh, so if you've ever uh, done that thing where you were in a place and then you kind of like start daydreaming uh, and then maybe you like fall uh, in the dream and then you like jerk back, that's what's re referred to as a hypnagogic jerk. Uh, because if you were fully asleep, your body wouldn't move in response. So because you're in that middle state between full sleepiness and full wakefulness, uh, you kind of don't get all the benefits of being asleep. Uh, so if you've ever experienced something like that, that's hypnagogia. So narcolepsy uh, runs in families, uh, or it seems to, we haven't identified the gene related to it. And it uh, is caused by a lack of ability to produce orexin. Uh, so sometimes stimulant drugs are used. The treatment for any type of issue with sleepiness is usually just a stimulant. Uh, so it enhances dopamine and norepinephrine activity. It's not a perfect solution. And sometimes what ends up happening is you treat narcolepsy and then you end up with insomnia. But uh, for people who need to stay awake, right, uh, it's better than falling asleep at the wheel of a car. So sometimes during NREM sleep, you might experience what is called periodic limb movement disorder, uh, which is uh, involuntary movement of the legs or arms while you're sleeping. So if you remember, we talked about sleep paralysis, which is when you are awake, but your body is not moving. Uh, this uh, REM behavior disorder is the opposite your body is moving when it shouldn't be. Uh, so you're having these vigorous movements during REM sleep, and the difficulty with this is that you can injure yourself while you're sleeping. Or if there's somebody in your bed with you, congratulations, uh, or, you know, a, a dog uh, or cat uh, or a giant lizard, right? Whatever is your preference, uh, or birds, uh, how many animals can I list, or a plant, uh, or just uh, a bunch of mushrooms, you know, uh, the, not the magic ones. Uh, but uh, if you are acting out in your sleep, you could injure yourself or injure someone else or scare your dog. Then we have night terrors and sleepwalking. Uh, so night terrors are uh, intense periods of anxiety uh, during sleep. Uh, the, uh, I'm not sure if this is a fun fact. None of the fun facts that I give are ever fun. Uh, but when uh, somebody, so you will uh, be uh, in the middle of sleep and start screaming wildly. Uh, and often when you wake up, you have no recollection of that happening. So oftentimes uh, children might have night terrors and then their parents will come running into their room worry that somebody's breaking into the house uh, or something crazy like that. And then the child will go, I don't know what you're talking about, mom and dad. I wasn't screaming. Come on, be chill, right? Then we also have sleepwalking, which we talked about before, uh, which uh, often occurs in very young children during stages three and four of sleep. Uh, but it's not related to dreaming because it's in stages three and four. A lot of people say that uh, it's dangerous to wake a sleepwalker. If somebody's about to do something dangerous, stop them. If you're like, if they're about to get into the car and you're like, oh, they're about to drive the car while asleep, but I don't want to wake them, that could give them anxiety. No, wake, wake them up. Uh, so, um, fun fact, uh, this one's actually a fun fact. There is, uh, a condition called sexsomnia, uh, which is engaging in sexual behavior while asleep. Uh, so, uh, that's a, that's a real awkward one to explain to your roommates. Not that I know from personal experience, but happened to a friend of mine. Uh, and then also, um, uh, obviously night terrors and sleepwalking can pose a threat to romances and marriages, right? Uh, you got some cutie in your bed that you're sharing it with and you just start screaming in the middle of the night. It can be very jarring for the person, right? Uh, so 
the uh, the difficult thing about a lot of sleep uh, disorders uh, is some of these don't have really clear uh, and uh, you know proven rely reliably proven methods for treatment. Uh, so uh, because we only understand so much about how sleep occurs in the brain, it's very hard to pinpoint a specific treatment for all of these. Our brains want us to sleep. If you've ever tried to pull an all-nighter, no matter what you try, your brains are very sneaky. Uh, there are things called micro-sleeps where if you stay up long enough, your body will just fall asleep on you. Oh, sorry, I've been working all night on this lecture. Uh, but if you've, um, I have experienced this and then I said I'm never doing this again. Uh, and I've had friends who've experienced this where you stay up all night, you need to drive somewhere, you're driving, and then you fall asleep for five seconds at the wheel. If that happens to you, it's frightening. And your body goes, we need to sleep, you idiot. So if you're not going to let us sleep, then we're just going to sleep for you, right? Uh, it's like when your computer keeps on telling you to update and you're like, I'll update later, I'll update later, right? And then at a certain point, like uh, while you're not looking, it just automatically updates for you and restarts everything. And you're like, I should have just up I should just closed everything, saved it and updated, right? So our brain wants to sleep. So sleep deprivation, don't do it if you can avoid it. Figure out ways to make sure you can get adequate sleep. So sleep is great for a lot of things, resting your muscles, decreasing your metabolism, uh, doing cellular maintenance, so that cleanup between synapses and trimming of stuff, reorganizing those synapses, and reinforcing your memories. The original purpose of sleep was probably to conserve our energy. If we were awake all the time, we'd just be burning more energy. So we decrease our body temperature a little bit and we decrease our muscle activity. So, you know, that saves energy. And especially when food is sparse, uh, not being alert all the time is great. In the same way, our computers and phones, they'll turn off their screens after a while because they don't need to be on. If we're not looking at anything, we don't need to have them on, right? Our phones sleep, we sleep, are we phones? I don't know. So hibernation, you know how like bears do, uh, is similar to sleep, but just a longer sleep. You see the same decrease in body temperature. You see heart rate and brain activity like decreasing. Uh, in hibernation, it drops to almost nothing. Uh, neurons will shrink, dendrites will lose a fourth of their branches, and once the body temperature increases again, they'll be replaced. There are some creatures like the tardigrade that can go into real crazy hibernation, and they can stay that way forever. Uh, if you want to be freaked out, look up tardigrades. Fun facts about hibernation. Uh, when animals hibernate, they do come out of hibernation for a few hours every few days, and it slows down the aging process. So if you're getting some crow's feet, why don't you try sleeping for six months? And then uh, hibernation is also a period of uh, pretty relative invulnerability to infection and trauma. Uh, so yeah, hibernation is pretty cool. So not all animals sleep in the same way. If you have pets at home, you might notice that some of them sleep a majority of the day, right? Now, uh, the things that affect how much you sleep are things like, are you a predator or are you prey? Uh, how much time do you spend during the day or night looking for food? And how safe are you while you sleep? So if you can be in a tree, uh, and you don't have to worry about things eating you or bury yourself underground, 
then you're pretty safe. If you're having to sleep out in the open, you're probably going to sleep less frequently or maybe even for short periods of time, uh, but not uh, like uninterrupted long stretches of time. So uh, we have our super lazy cats and armadillos over here sleeping 15 to 19 hours a day. We have us, uh, and here's another primate right here, the rhesus monkey. Uh, and look at cows and goats and sheep and horses sleeping less than four hours a day. They also are easily aroused out of sleep. So if you see a cow sleeping, let him sleep, leave him alone. So sleep is very important when it comes to memory, when it comes to enhancing learning and strengthening memory. By sleeping, uh, you'll see that there is increased brain activity in the part of a brain which is responsible for learning a new task when one is sleeping. So uh, often what you'll see, if you've ever been struggling with a problem, uh, this happens to me when I'm playing video games, I'll be playing late at night. There is this boss that I just can't beat. Like I'm having trouble figuring out their patterns. I'm just like, this is impossible. But you go to sleep, you wake up the next morning, you try it and you do it the first time. And there's something about sleep uh, that allows us to uh, consolidate our information. And we're working on problems uh, and figuring out those solutions while we're asleep. So if you're having issues with something, take a break, right? Uh, sometimes just uh, trying it for a while and struggling with it, going to sleep and waking up the next day is all you need. The brain patterns in your hippocampus while you're learning a new task are similar to the brain patterns in the hippocampus that you would see while you were sleeping. And we assume that the reason for this is because your brain is replaying the information that you learn, and that's what helps consolidate that information. So also while you're sleeping, your brain is strengthening some synapses and weakening others to reinforce the things that are most important. So we get a lot of sleep. One third of your life is spent being asleep. Unless you are a college student, then it's like one fourth of your life. Get some sleep, guys. Go to sleep. Get, what are you doing right now? We could finish the rest of this lecture later. Take a real quick nap. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Uh, so one third of our lives are spent asleep. One fifth is spent in REM sleep, obviously. Uh, cats, uh, look at my little buddy right now. Uh, he is asleep right now. They can spend up to 16 hours a day sleeping, and a lot of that is REM sleep. Uh, the percentage of REM sleep uh, goes up the more you sleep. Uh, so we, uh, uh, if you're a normal human, or I guess technically an abnormal human, because some of us just don't like sleeping, uh, but the more sleep that you're getting as a human, the higher percentage of REM sleep you'll be getting. It's very hard for us to know for sure what's happening during REM sleep. We're very limited in our ability to observe that. Uh, we're assuming that the brain gets rid of useless uh, connections and helps consolidate specific skills that we're trying to learn, specifically motor skills. Uh, the, uh, in 1998, uh, Marie suggested that uh, REM just shakes the eyeballs back and forth uh, to make sure that we get uh, oxygen to the corneas, which could be all that it is, right? There are things in evolution uh, that have specific purposes uh, and then weird side effects. So it could just be that the reason why we have REM sleep is so that our eyes don't die from a lack of oxygen. And dreams, the dreams that we have during REM could just be a weird side effect of that. We don't know, right? That's a hard thing. It's hard to ascribe a purpose to evolution. We just, we know what happens, but 
uh, saying why, usually it's just, well, just because. That's just what it is. The younger you are, the more sleep you get. The older you are, the less sleep you get, or rather the less sleep you need. So uh, little bitty babies in the, those first couple months, they're getting about equal amounts of uh, REM and uh, NREM, right? Uh, now, if you're in this area right here, uh, I hope I have a few 13-year-olds uh, in the class uh, just <laughs> hanging out being 13-year-olds in the psych class. Uh, the percentage of REM sleep that you're getting is much smaller compared to your non-rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, and then here uh, in your uh, 70s, uh, on average, you only need about six hours of sleep. Uh, and the amount of time you spend in REM sleep is going to be about an hour. Uh, so one interesting thing uh, is that children uh, and adolescents need significantly more sleep. So here's, uh, you know, let's say you have a 15-year-old uh, versus a 33-year-old, uh, right? Uh, they need about an hour more sleep per night. And what ends up happening is we wake children up pretty early in order for them to go to school, which means a lot of children end up very sleep deprived. So one, a lot of doctors actually suggest uh, that we make school start a little bit later uh, so that children can get adequate sleep. Now, there are issues with this, and one of the common complaints is, well, who's going to get their children to school an hour later? People have work, and it's sometimes very hard to coordinate work schedules around getting kids to school. So uh, it is an issue that hopefully eventually we solve, but a lot of kids are going to school sleep deprived. Dreams are hard to study, and one of the hardest things about studying dreams is the fact that people have a very hard time remembering dreams. If you say, so let's just say I asked, oh, did you have any dreams last night? Tell me about them. You might say, oh, I, don't ha I didn't have any dreams. I don't dream. Now, it is possible that you do dream, but oftentimes we don't remember our dreams. If we don't try to remember what we were dreaming about right when we wake up, we're gonna have a very hard time recalling our dreams. And if you know anything about memory, you also know that trying to recall something will never be as accurate as the actual event. So if I had a dream that I was being chased by woods, uh, or sorry, chased by wolves in the woods, and they led me to a uh, cottage made out of candy, and inside was Idris Elba, uh, and he was like, would you like some candy? My name is Idris Elba, right? Uh, if I tried to remember the number of woods, or all of the candy that was in the house, or what Idris Elba was wearing, uh, by the way, it was a blue tuxedo, uh, I might have a hard time remembering some of those details. How long the chase happened, uh, how many trees I passed by. Uh, maybe there were birds chirping in my dream that I don't remember as I'm trying to recall it. So studying dreams is difficult because we can't always get accurate information on the dreams. So one theory for dreaming is what's called the activation synthesis hypothesis, which is the idea that your pons is creating this spontaneous activity, which activates other parts of your cortices, uh, which then take all that uh, activation and synthesize a story from that activation. So sometimes sensory information is integrated. So let's say your roommate uh, or your family member was cooking salmon in the uh, kitchen while you're dreaming. Uh, in your dream, you might see somebody eating uh, some salmon or something like that. Uh, or if you uh, hear the TV because the TV is on, 
you might hear what's happening on the TV and that might be processed in your dream. Then we have the neurocognitive hypothesis, which is basically that our dreams are just us thinking while we are asleep uh, and that stimuli is then just combined with recent memories and information uh, from what's happening uh, around us, so our sensory input, and that creates a dream. And because we're not getting any visual information, our brains will create visual stimuli for us to process. So if you've ever heard of a sensory deprivation tank, you wear these little cups over your eyes so that if you, uh, even if your eyes are open, you cannot see anything. And what ends up happening is if your senses are deprived for a long period of time, uh, your uh, mind will start creating things. Uh, so any sensory deprivation, at a certain point, your brain will, uh, your neurons will start firing in order to create something. Uh, and so that could just be why we dream. Our, uh, we're not getting enough stimulation uh, to our visual cortices, so your brain just like, we're bored. Let's just, uh, let's just make something up. And uh, one important thing to note here is uh, your uh, prefrontal cortex, some of that activity is suppressed, which is going to impair your working memory during dreaming, uh, which is also probably why we have a hard time remembering all of our dreams, because we need to be able to process that information in order for it to be stored in long-term memory for us to uh, recall it later. So in order for the neurocognitive uh, hypothesis to be true, we need to see stimulation in your visual cortices uh, and high activity in the hypothalamus and amygdala, which will give us the emotional and motivational content of our dreams. So being scared, being in love, being hungry, if you've ever had dreams where you're just wanting to eat food, right? That requires uh, activity in the hypothalamus and the amygdala. And then for the visual imagery of dreams, you need to have a lot of activity in the visual parts of your brain. So the stimulation for that will lead into an eventual dream can come from any of the cortices, your parietal lobe, your occipital lobe, your temporal lobe. Uh, the, when you're not receiving any sensory input from your visual cortices, uh, so you know your eyes are closed, you're not seeing anything. And if you don't have your prefrontal cortex uh, active and saying like, hey, uh, you know, we're awake and we're doing things, uh, then your brain is going to create these hallucinations, which we love to call dreams. So thanks for being along for this wild ride. Uh, just in case you were worried about me being uh, super uh, tired and hungry, uh, this was recorded over 12 uh, to like 15 hours. So I took a break midway last night because I just fell asleep and I woke up, I ate food. Uh, so I'm alert my pawns is doing its job. There's a cedar calling in there. Uh, GABA, you're going to have to wait until later. I hope you get some sleep, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day.